How great is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for instance, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu udhkuru Allah zidran kathira. Remember Allah with much remembrance. And in this verse, you have an imperative verb, an imperative, it's called fi'il amr. And then you also have an infinitive absolute at the end of the verse for another emphasis. So this is doubly emphasized that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba, their tongues were so moist in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when they used to go to the bathroom, they had to put uh, stones underneath their tongues. Because they kept saying, La ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah. They kept saying, it was habitual. You go to the bathroom, you can't make thicker with your tongue. So they have to put stones under their tongues to remember, to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how inundated they were with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet gives us a parable. He says, مَثَلُ الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ رَبَّهُ وَالَّذِي لَا يَذْكُرُ مَثَلُ الْحَيِّ وَالْمَيِّتْ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ He says, the similitude of one who remembers his Lord and the one who does not is like the difference between the living and the dead. Right? So the earth is full of walking corpses. Because if you're spiritually dead, you're essentially dead. If you're spiritually dead, you are essentially dead. Uh, you can turn on the TV and see dead people all the time. All right, we all have the sixth sense. I see dead people. Uh, so, the scholars say that we have to die before we die. I don't know if you've heard that expression before. Die the death to the world or to the dunya and will focus you on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing that, you will actually begin to live. The Prophet advised us to remember death 20 times a day, to remember often the destroyer of pleasures, and by that he meant death. And it's not so that there's a morbid fixation on death, right? It's so that you may actually start living and realizing that you're alive, right? It adds value to your life. For example, if you're leaving your house in the morning, uh, bring death to the forefront of your mind and think, I may never see my wife ever again, right? I may never see my children ever again. How would you say goodbye to them? This is how we should pray. We'll talk about it. When you stand for prayer, for prayer, فَصَلِّ الصَّلَاةَ مَوَدِّرَ When you stand for prayer, the Prophet Sallallahu gave advice to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He said, when you stand for prayer, pray as if you are saying goodbye. You're saying goodbye. You're waving farewell. This is how we should live our lives. By it, we actually become alive. Right? When Malcolm was asked in 1964 when he returned from Hajj and he left the nation, he was asked by a reporter, uh, he said, uh, you're a marked man, are you afraid? And Malcolm said, as far as I'm concerned, I died 20 years ago. I'm not afraid of anything. I only fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the way of the samurai. You know the samurai, ancient Japanese uh, warriors? They would convince themselves that they were already dead. <laughs> so there's nothing to fear in battle. Right? So just as there are people who are physically alive and spiritually dead, there are also people who are physically dead, but spiritually alive. Like the shuhada, this is from the Quran. Don't say they're, they're dead. And what? Don't say they're amwat. They're alive. But you don't perceive it. And they're receiving sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a famous pericope of Isa, which is a Christian source, Luke chapter 15, it's called the prodigal son, where he's reported to have said, This son of mine was dead and is now alive. Right? What does this mean? Who are the dead ones? Those in whose hearts, those whose hearts are devoid of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Istahwada alayhi mu shaytan. Ta'ansahim dhikr Allah ulaika is wa shaytan. He says, The evil one has got the better of them, and that he caused them to lose the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the fellowship of Satan. Uh, it's a hadith of uh, Umm al-Mu'minin Aisha, radiallahu anha. She said, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yafkuru laha fi kulli ahyanihi. She said the Prophet used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of his states. In all of his states, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
When he left the house, he remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he walked into the house, he left the masjid, walked into the masjid, went into the bathroom, walked out of the bathroom, went uh, on a journey, when he returned from a journey, in all of his space, he was remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Aisha asked him, uh, do you sleep before Ruta? And he said, yeah, Aisha. Aynayna uh, and Aynayya tanamani wala yanamu qalbi. He said, my eye is asleep, but my heart is awake. His heart was in the Divine Presence, and his heart would affect those who were in his presence. There was a companion named Hanzala who uh, came to Abu Bakr Siddiq, and he said, uh, he said, Asfahtu munafiqan. So I've become a munafiq, this companion named Hanzala. And Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Astaghfirullah, why, why do you say that about yourself? And he said, well, when I'm in the presence of a messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm filled with this intense spirituality. But when I leave his presence, it begins to wane, and then it leaves me. Astaghfirullah munafiqan, I become a munafiq. And then Abu Bakr Siddiq said, in that case, Astaghfirullah munafiqan. Right? So they both went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they said, have we become, become munafiqi? And the Prophet said, no, you have not. If you were to remain in that state, as you are in my presence, you would be shaking hands with angels in the street. Right? His heart was in the Divine Presence. His heart was annihilated in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should know that a heart annihilated in the remembrance of Allah produces an inspired tongue. And a tongue inspired to speak by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will affect the world. It will, it must positively affect change. Many of us say, you know, I make da'wah and nothing happens. I make da'wah, I go and I preach and I do this and that, no one's converting, I think I'm wasting my time. We, we have to look earnestly inside of our hearts. What's in our hearts? You have to be very honest with yourself. Look inside of our hearts. You find lust, you find Ben Franklin, it's all about the green, Harry Potter, <laughs> Frodo Baggins, <laughs> the Oakland Raiders. These are idols. These are asnam. What is in your heart? The tongue is the revelator of the heart. That's the function of the tongue, is to reveal what is in the heart. If you want to know what is beloved to you, what are you talking about? That's how you can tell. What are you always talking about? Whatever you're always talking about is what you are, are in love with. That's your, that's your habib, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was inundated with remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he was in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the munafiq is so dangerous, the true hypocrite, because he says with his tongue that which is not in his heart. They have a disease in their hearts. Right? So we need to enliven our hearts. Now, in ancient Israel, the, the high priest of the Temple of Solomon uh, once a year, on the tenth day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, would go into the Temple uh, of Solomon, into the innermost sanctuary of the Temple. And by the way, the tenth, the tenth day of the first month of the lunar calendar is what? It's Yom Ashura. This is Muharram. This is called Yom Kippur in Hebrew. This is the holiest day uh, in all of Judaism. They fast the entire day. Right? They used to fall exactly in line with the tent of Muharram at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was happening. And then they started to use an intercalary month, an extra, like a leap month every three or four years, so that the Hebrew calendar would jive with the Gregorian calendar or the Christian calendar. Right? That's why Hanukkah is always in December. You notice that? It always moves around December. Because if it's a lunar calendar, it should move back 11 days every year, just like Ramadan does. Just like Eid does, but it doesn't. Anyway, he would go into the innermost sanctuary of the temple. And the word temple in Hebrew is heikal. You ever heard the expression, your body is a temple? Because heikal is actually a Canaanite word, which means body. The innermost temple was called the Qadosh HaKadashim, the Holy of Holies. Right? And this is, a, this is a, an analogy for the human heart. The priest would go into the innermost sanctuary of the body, and he would pronounce the ineffable name of God. God has a name that only the high priest knew. It's called Hashem in Hebrew, the name. Al-Ism al aham the great name. He would pronounce this name, and he would supplicate 
uh, for the believing community by pronouncing the name of God in the heart of the temple. In, in other words, your heart should be reserved only for the holy name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remove all of these idols out of your heart. Remove them all out. Remove the dunya. dunya. The love of the world, right, is the head of every sin, this hadith. This doesn't mean that we have to reject the dunya. That's not our tradition, this kind of monasticism, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that this is not even in the original teachings of Isa alayhi salam. Because the Christian monks, they practice this uh, type of lifestyle, monasticism. Athanasius of Alexandria, he wrote the first biography of the first Christian monk ever. Christian monk's name was Anthony from Egypt. It's called the life of Anthony, the fourth century. And he praises Anthony, he says, after he was baptized, he never ever touched water ever again in his life. And he's praising him for that. He says he never bothered to clean filth from his body ever again in his life. And he's praising him for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and this is supposed to be pious behavior. He says, we did not prescribe this type of thing for the followers of the Isa So, but the Prophet ﷺ told us, he warned us, don't let the dunya take over. You can partake of the dunya, the Prophet ﷺ partook of the dunya, but do not let the dunya, the hubbu dunya, the love of the world, dunya means lower world, the earth, the earth that we're living. Don't let it into your heart. There was a group of three Sahaba who came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to divorce our wives and go out and live in the wilderness and fast every day. And he said, are you better than I am? And he said, no. <laughs> no. Uh, and he said, I don't do that. Man an sunnati I said that this is the context of this hadith. Whoever turns away from my sunnah is not from me. Right? So we don't have this extreme type of uh, monkish uh, lifestyle. Don't let the dunya into your heart. So, uh, now, a very common polemic against our uh, theology is that the God of Islam, you probably heard this a lot, is, is, is impersonal. He's not approachable. You can't have a personal relationship right, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's unreachable. Now, we reject this idea. It's a Neoplatonic idea. It's also a deist idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is somewhere in the heavens, a shalfa Allah, very anthropomorphic. He's enamored by his own reflection. He's just looking and admiring himself. Uh, indifferent to his creation. We reject this type of idea, right? This is a deist idea, but many of the founders of this country were Freemasonic deists. That was their theology, right? Like George Washington certainly wasn't a Christian. He, he rejected communion. He was a 33 degree Freemason. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a Bible where he crossed off all of the so-called <laughs> references to the divinity of Jesus. He crossed them all out and said, I don't believe this. He also had a Quran, by the way. You guys know that? Uh, Benjamin Franklin was really interesting. Benjamin Franklin was a, many people say he was an atheist. Uh, he lived in England for 16 years. He was part of a group called the Hellfire Club. The Hellfire Club. So it's one of these secret societies. They meet underground in caves and do these ajib or ghalib type of thing. You know, I can't even go into it. Uh, but he has a house on Craver Street in London. He lived there for 16 years. In 1993, uh, there was a custodian that was sweeping his basement who settled upon human remains in the basement of Benjamin Franklin. Do you guys know about this? They found thousands of human bones, thousands, men, women, and children, in the basement of Benjamin Franklin on his house on 16 Craver Avenue in England. Yeah, talk about WikiLeaks. <laughs> the, the Prophet he lived a transparent life. The intimate details of his life were known, right? This is, he has full disclosure, transparency, doing things behind the shadows, and it comes out later. That's why, you know, there's, these people write these books, The Truth About Muhammad, right? Some, some profligate wrote this book called The Truth, like, as if it's some expose that no Muslim has ever heard of. All of this stuff is well known to Muslims, and Muslims have dealt with it. Part of the problem is that they don't understand the nature of Sira literature. Sira literature is not one of our sources. Sira literature has no weight in Sharia, in creed, and in nothing, nothing. Right? It was the intention of the early historians to collect as much information about the Prophet as possible because they were being objective. They were being transparent. 
Right? So what they do is they look at the Prophet through the lens of their own diseases. And that's what a monafik does. That's exactly what a hypocrite does. A hypocrite sees someone doing a good deed and asks himself, why would I do that? To show off. That's why he's doing it. Right? So, <clears throat> this is, we reject this idea that God is far removed from his creation. We also reject what we consider to be the other extreme, which is the Christian idea that God comes into the temporal world. He comes into his creation, thus making an idol out of himself. Right? And dwells in flesh and blood, and so on and so forth, as a divine incarnation, a divine avatar. Right? If I can use the word avatar. <laughs> uh, a few days ago, I was watching, uh, I was flipping the channels. My daughter was doing her Arabic homework. She's eight years old, uh, next to the table, and I know I shouldn't be watching TV while my daughter's doing her Arabic homework. <laughs> I've already heard the lecture from the boss. Anyway, um, <laughs> we know who that is. <laughs> so, I'm flipping the channels, I got on low volume, and I come to this, this Christian preacher, and I, I love listening to preaching, right? I'm kind of a weird guy. So, he's, he's saying, uh, he's like, God came to earth. He came to earth. And, and, and my daughter is just kind of doing her homework, and she goes, God, earth, negative. <laughs> Eight years old. I said, Subhanallah. That's some theology right there. <laughs> you know, it's mentioned in three Gospels Mark 10 18. This is for the note takers. <laughs> Mark 10, 18, Luke 18, 18, Matthew 19, 17, a Jew comes to Christ and says, he says, it's in, it's in Greek, the original gospel is in Greek, he says, good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus responds and says unto him, he puts the object before the verb, why me are you calling good? He's stressing, like, how dare you call me good? This is the effect of the Greek. There is no one good but one, and that is God. This is, this is multiply attested in Mark 10, 18, Luke 18, 18, Matthew 19, 17. The Old Testament says in Hebrew, Lo ish el, very clear. It's rhetorically perfect. Lo ish el, God is not a man. Very, very clear. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent. He's outside of time, space, and direction. But he's also close to us. When my servants ask you concerning me, say, Indi qarib, I am close to them. The word qarib, the cognate in Hebrew, is qarib, which, which, which means an internal organ. The word qarib, which is where we get the word qarib, meaning close, means an internal organ in its etymology. Right? This is ajib. nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min habil al-wareed. We are closer to him, meaning man in the generic sense, right? Man and woman, the human being, than his, than his jugular vein. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that close to us. If we were truly cognizant of Allah's nearness to us, we would cease to function. It's actually a mercy that we're somewhat uh, detached from Allah's presence. We would, we, would, we would cease to function if we were suddenly aware that Allah is truly, essentially closer to us in our jugular veins. He has our sinful actions that turn us away from him. And this is a mercy. This is why Allah gave us Tawbah, because we need Tawbah. We need it. Right? Uh, Mullah Ali Qari actually says in the Mirfat, Mullah Ali Qari, he says that there's actually a khilaf, there's a difference of opinion as to which man or woman is better. The one who sinned and made Tawbah, or the one who never sinned at all. There's actually a difference of opinion as to which one is better, right? Ultimately, he said, the one who never sinned is better because he's closer to the prophets who are masum, they're free of make your sin. But it's just interesting that you have this, uh, you have this difference of opinion regarding this issue. Ibn Atakillah says in one of his aphorisms, he says, an act of sin that leads to shame and impoverishment and brokenness before Allah is better than a good action that leads to arrogance. There's a beautiful story in Book 40 of the Ihya. It's called Kitab al Dhikr al Maut wa Ma Ba'ahu by Abu Hamad al Ghazali. Ihya al Muddin. This is Sumo Theologic of Traditional Islam. He tells the story of a man who was a town drunkard and he you know, opened fasted. 
he used to spend his days in the habut, in the, in the tavern, in the bar, whatever, drinking. And he died. And the people of the town refused to wash his body. We're not going to wash his body, he's a fasser, right? You can't bury him in our cemetery either. So his poor wife had to wash his body, and then she made some sled and took him all the way out into the desert with the intention of burying her husband and praying over his body. While this was happening, uh, she's digging this ditch, a Gnostic, an Aras Villa, a Gnostic, walks by, he sees the scene, and he rushes down, and he says, I want to help you bury your husband. And she says, fine. So he buries the body, and he prays over it, and then she says, why did you want to help me? Do you know who my husband is? He said, yes, I know very well who your husband is, and I wanted to help you. And she says, what do you mean? And he says, last night I had a dream, and I heard a voice that said, tomorrow you'll be traveling in the desert, You'll see a woman trying to bury her husband. Help her because her husband was a man of Jannah. He's a, he's a man of paradise. Right? So he prays over the body and then he leaves. Now the townspeople come out and they see what had happened. So they approach his wife and they say, why did he do that? And she says, I don't know. And they said, can you think of a reason why he's a man of Jannah? And she said, there's only three reasons I can think of. He was never devoid of one or two orphans that he would love and care for more than his own children. And every morning when he would wake up from his wine, he would change his clothes, make, take a shower, make ghusl, and go and pray salat al-fajr fi jama'ah fi masjid. He would pray in congregation in the mosque, the morning prayer. And when he would come home from his wine, he would go into a secluded corner of the room, he'd fall down to his knees, he'd raise his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and say, Oh Allah, which corner of hell are you going to fill with this wretched man? Referring to himself. And he'd be in that state of supplication and repentance until he fell asleep. This is why we need to be in a state of toba. The word toba in its etymology means to turn, right? To turn. To in Allah, literally, turn to Allah. Ya tawa. Oh, the most forgiving, turn towards us. Uh, it's the same in Hebrew. The word is, the verb is shuv, yeshuv, teshuva. Ezekiel says in the Old Testament, Ezekiel is probably Dhul Kifil, alayhi salam, Allahu alam. But he says, if the wicked would repent from his sins, the Hebrew says, yeshuv mekol chatotav. Literally, turn from his sins. What is the result? Yihye lo yamut. He shall live, he shall not die. This is repentance according to the Bible. This is how to reconcile yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's through tawbah, not vicarious atonement. No one has to do any bloodletting of any, of any type. You do it through tawbah. This is biblical teaching. Um, so, the divine care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his creation is demonstrated in this, in this sublime prophetic parable. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, we find this hadith in canonized books of hadith. Uh, he said, uh, Imagine a man walking through the desert uh, or traveling through the desert upon his conveyance. He, he dismounts for a moment only to notice that his conveyance has left him. And all of his supplies and food has left as well. And just as the harsh reality of his death begins to occur to him, he spots his conveyance. Right? He runs up, he grabs its reins. He falls to his knees, and he, and he raises up his voice to the heavens, and he says, Ya Allah, anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He says, Oh Allah, you uh, are my servant, and I am your Lord. He got it backwards. He was so delirious. He was so, he was so overjoyed that he lost control of his speech. This is a hadith of the Prophet The Prophet concluded and said, that Allah is more overjoyed than that person is at that moment. When a sinner turns from his life of sin and makes repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is more overjoyed than that man. You can think about it, have you ever been that happy? The ulama say that when the people of Jannah are entered into paradise, they're so happy that they, think they can only say, salam, 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 that's all they can say. They're so happy, they just, they're, they're out of it, right? They're shocked by it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not indifferent. Before we can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and live on our hearts, we, we have to have ma'rifah, we have to have gnosis of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He's not an indifferent Lord. He is ar-Rahman, he's al-Wadud, the loving, at tawab 
uh, in a tradition that's attributed to Isaiah Salam. He says, uh, isn't it amazing how willingly a shepherd will leave 99 of his flock? 99 flock, he'll leave very willingly to find the one sheep that went astray. And how happy is he when he finds it? The one that went astray. Right? Do you know why the Sahaba never engaged in speculative theological discourse? It's because it never occurred to them. Right? Because they experienced their faith. We have to experience our faith. It can't just be mechanics. The Sahaba noticed the Prophet raised his blessed hands uh, in supplication for rain. And they noticed that before he dropped his hands, his beard was soaking wet with rainwater. How does one after this, how do you, how do you witness that and then ask yourself two weeks later, is it really God? <laughs> right? Like we do. The problem is we're not experiencing our faith. Right? So I see Muslim people all the time that come to me and say, you know, I'm having a faith crisis. I say, what happened, brother? He, and he says, I took, a, I took a semester of biology at the university. My faith is shattered. One semester? You're just an undergrad. God bless you when you're a PhD student. Lack of yatim. We're not experiencing anything. It's just another science. But we should know how that intellect is limited. Intellect is very important, but it is ultimately limited. Right? This is not an intellectually elitist religion. Like Stephen Hawking says, I'm looking for the God equation. I want to prove God through an equation. Right? There is no such equation. Because that would mean that God has favorites. That the smarter you are, right, the more knowledge you can have of the divine. It doesn't work like that. Right? Or he says, uh, you know, uh, I have it all figured out. It's, there's always been matter. It's just the changing form. But there's always been matter. We, you know, these, these atheists, we define them sometimes as they don't believe in a God. No, everyone believes in a God. Atheists are actually mushrikeen. They're idolaters. They associate with God. Because to say that matter has always been here is to impute upon matter a divine attribute. A didim athati. Pre-eternality is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're saying that matter has always been there. There's, there, there's, it's the first God beginning. That's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is shit. Everyone has a God. Whatever takes priority in your life is a God. This is one, we got it all figured out. It took them four months to plug a hole in the ocean. <laughs> a hole that they made, by the way. If you know what happened in pre-eternality? Six billion years ago, you know exactly what happened. Huh? Uh-huh. Right. More power to you. So the prophets who are, who are intellectual giants, they took menial jobs, carpenters and shepherds, to demonstrate this ecumenical uh, nature or aspect of the religion, that is a universal religion. It's straight and wide. There's something for everyone, not straight and narrow. So we need to work on our ihsan, our spiritual excellence. Uh, and experiential theology is real. So what good is your knowledge if it's stuck up in your head and has it trickled down into your brain? There's a parable about this in the Quran. In the Quran. The method in himar, yahmiru asfar. Like a donkey who carries books on its head. It doesn't benefit from its books. There has to be something in the heart. Right? The heart has to be engaged. It's not all about knowledge. People, it's great to have knowledge, you have to. There's no, it's, it's, it's incumbent on every Muslim to gain knowledge, right? But when we neglect the heart, that's problematic. We take stories from the prophets. Khidr alayhi salam was the teacher of Musa alayhi salam, was he not? Musa alayhi salam is from Wulul Azam. He's one of the five most exalted human beings to ever live. Why isn't Khidr better than him? He's the teacher of Moses, right? He's more knowledgeable than Moses, but Moses is better. Because it doesn't always come down to knowledge. Jibreel alayhi salam is the teacher of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. But who's the khayyad khalqillah? Who's the best of creation? Who could not pass the siddhah of muntaha? Jibreel alayhi salam, who was made of flesh, who was made of, of light, could not pass beyond a region that the Prophet passed, and the Prophet is flesh and blood. Right? The Prophet wanted to remove his sandals. Allah said, keep them on. Why did his sandals burn? Because they're attached to his blessed feet. Right? He's the best of creation. You read Ali Islam as his teacher. We put so much emphasis on knowledge, and that's good. Don't get me wrong. We need to seek sacred knowledge. But we have to work on the heart. It's the most important thing. I've seen, I've seen students with beautiful akhlaq, 
go overseas to study, and they come back, they're full of all of this, this envy. And they're, they're very judgmental suddenly. Yeah, and he says, Haram, this is a facet, he's a kafir, and then she's this. And this. <laughs> <laughs> but before, he was a good guy, very unassuming, nice guy, very quiet, but suddenly he's, a, he's, a, he's an expert, or what my people say, you know, say he became a mullah. Right? <laughs> 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 so, we need to transcend the ritual. Rituals are a means to an end. So what is ihsan? This is at the very heart of this lecture. There's a famous hadith, which is called uh, Hadith Jibreel alayhi salam. So, this is narrated by Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattat, radhi Allah ta'ala anhu. And what she says, he says, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَمْ ذَاتِ يَوْمًا We are with the Messenger of Allah صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَمْ One day, إِذْ تَلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجْلٌ A man came to us, Shadidu bayad al-thiyab, with exceedingly white clothes. Shadidu sawad al-sha'ar, with exceedingly black hair. Right? لا يرى عليه أثر الصفا ولا يعرفه لنا أحد. There was no sign of travel on him, and none of us knew who he was. Right? So here's this man. He's, he's a stranger. You would think he's a traveler, but travelers are disheveled a little bit. They got some dirt on their clothes. This man's pristine. Right? As if he came, as if he fell out of the sky. This is not too far from the true building. حَتَّى جَلَسَ إِلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And then he sat in front of the Prophet. فَأَسْنَى الْرُكْبَتَيْهِ إِلَى الْرُكْبَتَيْهِ He sat directly in front of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم until his knees were touching his knees. And he's right, his face is right here. Right? فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ And he said, Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ tells him about the five pillars of Islam. Buni al Islam wa alaham, shahadati, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, wa iqam al salat, wa ita'il zakat, wa hajjid bayt, wa salam Ramadan. The five pillars of Islam. And then the man says, Salatta. That's right. And Sayyidina Umar says, He says, Fa'ajib nalahu. He says, That's ajib. Yes, aluhu, wa yusadiquhu. He, he, he asks the question and then he confirms his answer. Of course he's right. This is the messenger of God. Who does the man think he is? Sadaqta. This is the messenger of God. Who do you think you are? Right? Sid Omar took these. He's very personal. You don't mess around with the Prophet of Allah said them. And Sid Omar is around. Right? Ya Muhammad, fa'akhbirni al iman. Tell me about iman. And the Prophet of Allah told him the six articles of faith. Right? But then he asked him a third question. Ya Muhammad, and then Sadaqta. Kaysia. Sajid Nada. And then he says, Fa'akhbini al ihsan. Tell me about ihsan. Spiritual excellence. What is the response of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Al ihsan. Al ta'bud Allah. Ta anna ka tara. In lam ta kun tarahu. Ta inna hu yarak. He says, Ihsan, spiritual excellence, is to worship Allah as though you can see Allah. And if you can't see Allah, be fully cognizant that indeed he sees you. All right? This is ihsan. So how would you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? On the day of judgment, we're going to see the fire of Jahannam. Right? It's with, with, with Ayn al-Yaqeen, according to the Quran. We all see it. The angels will bring it. They'll move it to the left side of the Ash, according to the Hadith. And when that happens, everyone will fall to their knees. Everyone will fall to their knees. Right? You'll see everyone on their knees. And they'll be shaking. And it's related that Ibrahim السلام, who is, what's his title? Khalilullah. He's the friend of God. He will be telling himself, Ana Khaliluk. Ana Khaliluk. Ana Khaliluk. He's shaking and, and, and saying to Allah, just re trying to give himself peace of mind, I am your friend. I am your friend. This can't be for me, not this Jahannam. If Ibrahim is in that state, who is from Ulul Azam, Khalilullah, the maqam of the Khalil is in that state, what is our state? Everyone is in the state, except the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who will go and walk towards the fire, and the fire retreats from him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fire has khashia of the Rasul. And he will go and he will make sentence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah will say, Ya Muhammad al Fa'rasak. Raise your head and intercede for your people. Right? There's certain hadith that Muslims don't quote a lot. There's a hadith that says, Shafa'ati ahlil taba'ili ummati. A very famous hadith that my shafa'a is for the people of mortal sin in my ummah. But there's another hadith of the Prophet. 
Shafa'ati li akthari min al-nas. My shafa'at is for the majority of mankind. Right? People don't like to quote this like because it's controversial. Right? So, and then, what does it say? What does our tradition say? Each person, one by one, will be called by a caller. Fulan ibn Fulan, Allah is calling you. Go stand before him. Fulan ibn Fulan, Allah is calling you. Fulan ibn Fulan, Allah is calling you. You're going to hear your name mentioned in front of the whole of humanity, then you have to go stand before Allah. Imagine you're standing before Allah. Pray like that. Imagine that scene. That's how you should pray. Pray like that. Imagine you heard your name. Ali ibn, uh, Ali ibn Ghulam, which is my name. Allah is calling you. What, what's your state of mind? Pray like that. Imam Ghazali, he, uh, he says, um, there's something called subtle idolatry. For example, he says uh, a man is praying, so you're praying, and um, you notice a great man or woman walk into the room, someone that you want to impress. So what do you do? You extend your prayer because you want to appear pious. And you make your frustrations. It's a perfect nine degree. <laughs> bam! And then back up. Bam! And you perfect your touch week by saying, Ya Allah! And then you get that ring, right? You go on to the such dove. And you're, 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 he said, This is shirk, right? This is shirk. The Prophet said, Man salla yura'i, man salla yura'i faqad ashraka. This is called riya, ostentation. It's a form of in partnering with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he says, Imam Ghazali concludes and says, if you do that for a great man or woman who walks into the room, now realize that the sovereign ruler of the universe is watching you. How would you pray? Would you not perfect your prayer? Right? Pray like that. Listen to Allah's description of the monathopine in the Quran. When they stand, prepare, they're lazy. Right? When I read that, I almost fainted the first time. Because here's my prayer. <sighs> you have to be careful. They stand to salah, lazy. Yura'un and nasa, to be seen of men. They're ostentatious. They're ostentatious, right? Like you go into the prayer, you're leading a group of men, and you're saying, I'm just gonna do a quick Allahu Ahad in each raka'ah, you know, because I'm not really worthy to pray. And then your father walks in. Alif Lam. And they remember Allah but just a little bit. Just a little bit. Mudadabina Baina Dadik. They're distracted in the very midst of their prayer. They're going in and out of the prayer. They're being distracted. They see something, oh, look at cat. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Allah. <laughs> the first time I prayed to Allah, I was so embarrassed because I didn't know how to pray. I was 17 years old. And uh, I didn't have to do it. I had a do ring on. And I'm, I'm praying, and my friend comes into the masjid. And I go, don't let go. He's like, <laughs> they still give me a hard time about that. They never live it down, really. <laughs> so they, they can't focus. There's no hulur, there's no presence of mind. Right? So this sounds like us. You look at the Sahaba, there was a Sahabi who had a compound fracture in his leg. And back then, if you had a compound fracture, you're going to lose your leg. Right? You cut your leg off. So they attempted to cut his leg off, and he started screaming in pain. Right? He's a companion of the Prophet. So he said, help me up. So they helped him up, they're holding him up on his good foot. And he said, Allah, Akbar, and he began prayer. And they cut his leg off, he didn't make a sound because he's completely focused, right? There was a, a man from the Salaf who fell into a lion's den. <laughs> it's a true story. He fell into a lion's den. He was there for a long time. Eventually, they pulled him back out. And the student asked him, what were you thinking about in the lion's den? He said, I was thinking about the hukum, the legal ruling of getting lion, lion's dung on my clothes. <laughs> Did I pray with it or not? <laughs> Don't you pray for your life? He's not only things by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I got some of the dung on my clothes. And, you know, there's nothing I can do if you want to kill me, you'll kill me. But what do I do about the dung? <laughs> that was his position. The story of Imam Matic, when I talk about focus, 
Imam Malik was an Imam of Medina, and he was he was uh, he had this majlis where he would wear the white turban, take a shower, uh, he would put on oud and this and that. And, uh, he would uh, he would give the hadith of the Prophet. He would teach the Mawata. It was a book of uh, hadith, maybe the earliest book of hadith. Um, <laughs> they, give more time. Uh, uh, the, the, the Hanafis say that Abu Hanifa wrote a book before. We're not going to go into that. <laughs> anyway, it's the earliest book of Hadith. He was teaching out of this book uh, with his students in the room, and suddenly he's, he's in the middle of, of, of reciting a Hadith, and suddenly his face went pale, and he, he completed the Hadith, and then it happened again. And he kept reading the hadith. It happened over and over and over again. After the dars, the student said, Ya Shaykhuna, what happened to you? Why did you, why did you have that? He said, look between my back and my foe. They looked. A scorpion had lashed him 16 times. But he didn't want to interrupt the hadith. I left adab for the hadith. This is called focus. We need to have this focus. Also, the ulama say, don't jump into your prayer. Sometimes we jump into the prayer. Like we're doing something completely dunyawi, and then we suddenly jump into the prayer. Right? Like you're on the phone, yeah, large pepperoni, halal, <laughs> two liter Coke, uh, and how much is that? Twenty nine ninety five. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Don't jump into your prayer. You know, athletes they visualize. An athlete will visualize how we began. You know, the middle, the every step actually you'll visualize. That's what we have to do. prepare yourself. For the prayer, feel your opening takbir. You don't have to hear it, but feel it. It'll wake you up. We have to have adab with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Have adab. He's not a normal uh, entity, if I could use that word. Not like anyone else you're dealing with. Have adab with Allah. There was a there was a there was a wide receiver on the Buffalo Bills. You probably heard about this. He dropped the ball in the end zone at, at uh, in overtime. That means they could have won the game, right? <laughs> This is a professional football player. He's one of the most blessed people in the world in this, 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 with respect to the dunya. He tweeted God after this. He tweeted God. You heard it right. He tweeted God, and he said, quote, I praise you 24-7, and you do me like this? I'm not joking. Well, right, that's what he said. You can read about it. I don't know his name. That's exactly what he said. We have to have adab. We have to have adab with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when we mention his name, we don't just throw it out Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. Who are you talking about? Your mechanic? Your cousin? We're talking about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say Sayyidina Muhammad. Say Rasulullah. Say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say something. Allah doesn't call him like that. Show me a place in the Quran where Allah says, Ya Muhammad. Ya Ahmad. Never does he say that in the Quran. Allah has adab with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you don't have adab. With the Messenger of Allah. So we quoted this hadith earlier too. Ida punta tis salatika fa sali salatu muwadir. When you pray, pray something like your last prayer. Pray like that. The ulama also mentioned a way to lighten the heart in salah is tilawatul Quran bi tadabur. Is to recite the Quran with contemplation, with penetrating thoughts. Tadabur means to penetrate, but to find the end of something. Penetrating thoughts when you're reciting the Quran, and I highly, highly advise you to study the Arabic language. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a door to many sciences. Understand what's being recited at Salatul Tarawih. Tarawih means to rest. This is, it's supposed to be our repose, right? Now we say, I'm too tired to go to Tarawih. You're too tired to relax. Doesn't make any sense because we look at it as a chore. And it doesn't mean, when I say it means to rest, it doesn't mean that you're leaning. I've seen people leaning on walls during the prayer, leaning on walls. <laughs> there, was a, there was a brother a long time ago in the central Masjid. He locked his knees in Tarawir. And then, bam! <laughs> fell flat on his face. Because <laughs> he locked it. There was no blood flow. So he was out. <laughs> the Prophet said, My prayer is my repose. What's your repose? Watching TV? You know, when we synchronize our brain waves with the cathode rays, the synchronization. That's the repose for many people. They can't wait to go home and watch TV, because that's their, ah. Uh, when the Prophet would enter prayer, that was his, ah, uh, moment. That was, that was his repose. Think about that. What's your repose? Eating? Or overly gluttonous? 
There are provisions in this in our Sharia. In the Hanafi school of thought, a woman who's fasting can taste the food, right? As long as she doesn't swallow it, she can taste the food to see if it's salty or bitter or whatever. Because if her husband has a bad temper, right? I mean, there's provisions for it. There are men who are beating their wives over food. And it's so common, it's mentioned in the Sharia. This is a book. لَمْ لَمْ يَطْرِبْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِمْرَأَةً وَوَلَدًا أَوْ وَلَدًا أَوْ غُلَامًا قَطْ Imam Ali says and Aisha says who grew, both of these people grew up in the house of the Messenger of Allah since they were eight or nine years old. The Prophet never raised his hand to a woman, a child, or a servant with the intention of hurting them. But we have men beating their wives over burnt rice. What did you do to my biryani? <laughs> My mother doesn't make it like this. I can spend time with her. You know, you know how you say time flies and you're having fun? The Prophet Wasallam, he would recite the Quran sometimes for hours and hours and hours on end. Because he would, you lose yourself. Right? Because time goes by. It's like when you're watching Titanic for the first time. It was over. Three hours, the four hours later, right? You're watching a really good movie. It's the only analogy I can use that will understand. When it runs a really good movie, actually, you know, oh man, it's, two, it's three hours later. That's what the prayer of the Prophet was. In fact, in fact Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when he had become Muslim, he, he, he prayed behind the Prophet one prayer, and he said the Prophet began reciting Al Baqarah. And he got through the entire surah. And then he started Al Imran. He finished the entire surah. And then he started Al Nisa. And he finished the entire. And one Raqqa. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, suddenly a terrible thought came to my brain that I was going to leave the prayer of the Messenger of Allah. Aisha relates a beautiful hadith. In the very late night, when the two lovers would come together, he would go to his beloved. In the very late night, when the two lovers would come together, he, sallallahu alayhi wa would go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would stand and worship. That was his repose. That was his repose. And he would pray until his feet were swollen. And his wife said, Why do you do this with the Messenger of God? He was beloved of God. Shall I not be a grateful servant? Shall I not be a grateful, loving servant? The Prophet is worshipping Allah out of khashia. There's two types of fear. There's khawf and khashia. Khawf means you have fear of bodily injury. And the ulama use the example of a man walking through a, a forest and he's hearing noises like, Ooh. And so he's scared for his, 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 his person, his physical person. That's called khawf. And, this, and this, we worship Allah out of khawf, and it shouldn't be downplayed, right? The Ahmad al-Saruq, Qadi Abu Bakr al-Ibn Arabi, they say don't belittle that, because Allah does not belittle it in the Quran, right? To worship Allah out of fear of the fire, or wanting hope for the paradise. But there's a higher level called khashia, which is fear of displeasure. Not fear of bodily harm, but a fear of displeasing someone. For example, there are children who don't disobey their parents because they don't want to get beat. That's called khawf. I can't do that because my dad will be. <laughs> Makes sense, right? That's called khawf. But then there are children who love their parents so much, and their parents love them, that they don't want to displease their father. They don't care about getting beat. My father's going to be disappointed, and I can't deal with the disappointment. My father's disappointed, I'm disappointed. This is the khashiyah. This, this is the prayer of the Prophet Abu Hanifa said, if kings knew the pleasure that we're in, in our prayer, they would send their armies to come and, and take it from us. If the kings knew the pleasure that we're in in our prayer, and the Prophet would recite the Quran in slow, measured, rhythmic tones, and he'd repeat verses. Ayatul said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bi Quran layla. He would repeat one verse in the Quran the entire night. One verse in the Quran. Ta'ina tazabun, ta'ina tazabun, ta'ina tazabun. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he's repeating these verses, some of the pre-eternal meanings which are infinite in the Qur'an would occur to his heart. He would have futuhat, fawqa futuhat, openings upon openings while reciting the Qur'an. And this is possible for us too, it's not just for the prophets. Recite the Qur'an with tadabur, think about it. When you make your afkar after the prayer, enunciate, right? Think about it. Would you reward yourself for that? 
<laughs> Would you be working for them? No. The Prophet was so entranced in his prayer. The Sahaba noticed one time, he put his blessed hand out like this in the middle of his prayer. He went like this, put his hand out. And then he retreated very quickly. And they asked him about this. They said, why did you do that? He said, suddenly a vision of the grapes of paradise occurred before my eyes. And I reached to grab them, and then I saw the fire of Jehanna, and I just shaved my hand. Right? This is someone who is, whose heart is annihilated in the loss of time with God. This is the prayer. This is possible for us. Experience your theology. When you go down into Sajda, I'm almost done, Ishmael. When you go down into Sajda, increase your supplications. The Prophet said, The closest a servant is to his Lord is when he is in Sajda. Is that the clock right? It's 445. Yeah, 445. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> kind of there. Oh, that one, that one says 445. The closest a servant is to his Lord, in reality, not in any anthropomorphic or spatial way, is when you're in Sajda. Right? So the ulama say that Yunus alayhi salam, who was fit through mat in three levels of darkness, the darkness of the whale, the darkness of the ocean, the darkness of the night, when he was in the belly of the whale, but he made Sajda. In reality, he's closer to, to Allah than an angel standing in the big mat water in the seventh heaven. Because there's no proximity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He transcends space, time, and direction. Yunus Islam was closer to Allah in reality than an angel standing in the celestial Kaaba because he's in Sajda. Sayyidina Ali said, If the worshipper knew the extent of mercy that surrounded him or her during Sajda, he or she would never raise his or her head from Sajda. He would just be in Sajda and be content. There's a hadith of uh, Rabi'a ibn Ka'b, who said, uh, who, uh, the hadith is, is in Sahih Muslim. He served the Prophet sallallahu he brought him a, he brought the Prophet a bucket of water so the Prophet can make his wudu. That's, that's what he did. And the Prophet looked at him and said, son, ask me for something. Can you imagine him? Ask me for something. And <laughs> Rabi'a, mashallah, you know, he didn't say, you know, I, I want some, a herd of camels or goats. Or, he didn't think about dunya. He took advantage of it. As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. I ask you for your companionship in paradise. And then the Prophet said, Oh, well, hey, Adhanik, anything else? Anything else? Right? <coughs> look, at the, look at the generous nature, magnanimous nature of the Prophet. Oh, well, hey, Adhanik, who are that guy? That's it. That's all I want. Fa'indi ala nasika bi kafalat al sujood. Help me accomplish this for you by making such doubt in abundance. Help me accomplish this for you by making such doubt in abundance. Sajda is a means by which we can draw near to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet said there's a lump of flesh in the son of Adam. One lump of flesh in the son of Adam. If it is sound, the entire body is sound. It is the heart. Ask Allah for a sound heart and work on the heart. We work on our brains, work on our bodies, we work on everything else. Work on the heart. وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِعْتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ إِذْ جَاءَهُ رَبِّ رَبِّ إِذْ جَاءَ رَبُّهُ بِقَلْبِ السَّلِيمِ That Ibrahim has a sound heart, قَلْبِ السَّلِيمِ Ask Allah to purify your heart and take, take steps to accomplish that. Uh, a sound heart is a soft heart. There are some people who have hearts like stones, Allah says in the Quran. Oh, أَشَّنْتُ قَصْوَى We're even harder than a stone. There's two signs that you have a hard heart. Two signs. The Quran doesn't affect you. When you hear the Quran, it doesn't affect you. It's like you're hearing a newscast. You know a newscast? Unless it's Fox News or something. Because then it evokes emotion. It's all lies. <laughs> I'm talking about like uh, the regular news, like on local television. They're honest on local television. It's like, well, you hear the Quran, that's what we're... Uh, Hadi Giyad mentions in the Shifa that a group of Muslims were making zikr or praying, and a Christian traveler walked by. A Christian. He walked by. Just walked by and overheard the Quran and started crying. A Christian traveler. And so when they finished their prayer, they caught up to the man. said, what made you cry? He said, what an exquisite recital about God. What was that? This is a Christian who was affected by it. He started crying. When the court of the Najashi heard Surah Maryam, right? Surah Maryam has 98 verses. 72 of them end with the same two letters. This is an amazing symphony. Surah Maryam. When the Christians, the Najashi, the court of the Najashi heard Surah Maryam, in Arabic they cried. And they don't really understand Arabic. It's like the difference between Farsi and Arabic now. Some words will pick up. It was translated, they cried again. Because they recognize, they have soft hearts. That's one sign. The Quran doesn't affect you. 
The second sign is uh, the unmoved eye, the dry eye. You don't cry. This is a sign of a of a hard heart. The Prophet would weep frequently. And he would break certain cultural norms. Like it was seen as uncouth for Arab men at the time to cry. If men cried, they would go inside their tent and cry. But he would cry very openly. He would weep frequently. It was also uncouth for, uh, for a man to say his wife's name, or to admit that he loves her. Right? He loved his people, the Arabs loved their wives, but you can't, you can't, you can't say it to anyone. You can't say her name. When Harun asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said her name, and he made it public. Right? He would kiss children, also seen as uncouth. Like the Arab man who said, you kiss her when he kissed, the Prophet kissed al Hassanain, his grandchildren. And the Arab man said, you kiss children, I have ten sons, I've never kissed any of them. <laughs> the Prophet said, there's nothing in my religion for those who have no compassion in their hearts. Right? So the comprehensive treatment for the heart, almost done, inshallah. Number one, hunger. This is how to treat the heart, okay? This is for the note takers. Or if you have a good memory, which I doubt. <laughs> Remember the story from Shatati earlier? Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, hunger. If the stomach is full, the limbs become anxious and want to do things. Right? Have some hunger in your stomach. So yeah, he said, he said, a man, a man whose main concern is what goes into his stomach, into his stomach, is only as good as what comes out of his stomach. <laughs> Have vigilance at night. Just two rakat, rakatain. Pray to Hajjah. Two, two rakat. Takes you two minutes. You can play Qur'an Allah Wahad, which is Qur'an Allah Wahad. Ta'adilu thuduf al-Qur'an. It's worth a third of the Qur'an. Pray this in both rakah. It takes two minutes. Prayer in the night is, uh, is directly tied to the Prophet's uh, rank. Wa minan layli fatahajjit bihi. Nafilatan lak. Asa'an yab'athaka rabbuka maqamman mahmuda. Pray in the night. It's an additional prayer for you. Soon will thy Lord raise you to an exalted, praiseworthy rank. It's tied to his rank. Prayer in the night. The ulama say that wilaya, that sainthood is given in the night. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith, hadith Qudsi, on the tongue of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, my, my servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved by me than his fara'id, his obligatory acts of worship. And my servant continues to draw close unto me with his nawafil, his superoperatory acts of worship, like prayer in the night. Until I love him. This is Allah speaking on the tongue of the Messenger. Until I love him. Prayer in the night leads to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he continues, and then I become the eye by which he sees, the hand by which he strikes, the foot by which he walks. If he were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. In no anthropomorphic way. It doesn't mean that Allah becomes your eye and your hand. We're not, we're not literalists, right? We can see this from the Quran. Zechariah was an old man. He was a prophet, right? A prophet. And he had prayed for a son. His whole life, Allah did not give him a son. He forsook his dua. He said, it's not going to happen. My wife is too old, not too old. So he, he did forsook. And then he walked into the chamber, the mihrab of Maryam, who's was 11 or 12 years old. This is a prophet who has white hair. What sa'ala ra'chu shape? His head was gray, the Quran says. An old prophet who's a priest, he's a high priest, sees a 12 year old girl, and there's fruit next to her out of season. There's fruit out of season. So he says, Ya Mariwa, Anna laki hada. Where did you get this from? This is from God. Don't you know that God gives to whomever He wills without measure? He learned this lesson from a 12-year-old girl, Maryam alayhi salam. There's a strong opinion. It's a minority opinion. It's an Ashari opinion that Maryam was a prophet based on these stories. She's teaching a spiritual lesson to Zakaria alayhi salam, who is a prophet. It's from God. What happened? What happened right after that? He immediately turned back to Allah. Uh, uh, Right then and there, he supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, give me a son. While he was still standing, the angel came to him, Anallaha, Yubashiruka, Yahya, 
Allah gives you glad tidings of Yahya. With this renewed sense of Yaqeen, he learned from a 12 year old girl. He prayed immediately. He was given Bushra of a son named Yahya. If he, until I love him, and then I am the eye by which he sees, the hand by which he strikes, the foot by which he walks, if he asks anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. Number three, silence. Be taciturn in speech. Don't talk a lot. Right? I should tell myself. This is, this is one minute ago. This is one minute, ten minutes ago. <laughs> Be contemplative. Man samata najat. The Prophet said, whoever is silent is safe. If you're silent, you're safe. Man kari umino lillahi wa nomen akhiri, fad yakul khayra uli yasmut. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, just say what is good or just be quiet. They came to Isa alayhi salam, this is according to our traditions. They came to Isa alayhi salam and they said, Ya Ruh Allah, O Spirit of God, give us some advice. He said, don't talk. <laughs> he said, I mean, we can't do that. He said, don't talk. So we can't do that. And then he said, then talk only when absolutely necessary. That was his advice. <laughs> Number four, meditate in private. Find a private place, meditate. And assess your day. Assess to take yourself to account before you take it to account. Allah said, never mind. Allah Take yourself to account before you take into account. And when I say meditate in private, it doesn't mean you take your privacy a little gadget where you're, you're moving your thumbs or... No, get away from the gadgets. Don't be Inspector Gadget. You get away from Inspector Gadget? <laughs> Don't use your gadgets, right? One hour of tadabur and tafakkur, according to the hadith, is better than an entire night of worship. Use your brain. Exercise your brain. Use that hour to memorize Quran. Use an hour to memorize hadith. Use an hour to just contemplate what, what you did during that day. Right? And in your prayer, send salawat upon the Prophet This is the wajib according to Imam Shafi'i. Um, I'm out of time. I, I wanted to get into the supplication. Um, I'll just end with this one last point. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there's an amazing hadith that you should... There's a, there's a supplication, a dua. I hope you write it down. Um, that for after your prayer. It's found in the book of Abu Dawood and Nasa'i, and also in Nawi's Riyadh al-Salihin. The Prophet ﷺ came to Mu'ad ibn Jabal. And the Prophet took his hand. He said, Ya Mu'ad, Wallahi inni la'uhibbuk. Imagine this. Usually in a hadith, it's the Sahaba that are coming to the Prophet and saying, O oh, Messenger of God, I love you. Oh, my messenger of God, I love you. This time the Prophet goes to Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Ya Mu'ad, Wallahi, I swear to Allah, in me verily, let me book, I love you. Thumma usika, Ya Mu'ad, and I exhort you, la tada'anna fi dubi kulli salatin taqul, don't leave your place of prayer until you say, Allahumma ilmi ala dhikrika, wa shukrika, wa husni ibadatik. Learn this dua. Allahumma a'inni, Allah help me, ala dhikrika, to remember you, wa shukrika, to be grateful to you, wa husni ibadatik, and to be a good worshiper of you. Very short hadith. This is a hadith that the Prophet taught Mu'ad after testifying to him that he loved him. This is subhanAllah. Right? Um, yes, Allahumma a'inni, it's better to make them plural actually, it's a'inna. Is better according to the Imam. Allahumma a'inna 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 ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. You can find this hadith in, like I said, uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan uh, An Nasa'i, and Riyadh al Salihin, which should, everyone should have in their house. Volume 1 is hadith number 384, and volume 1 of Abu Zakaria and Nabawi's Riyadh al Salihin. I'm sorry I took too much of your time. So I'm going to